G'day, hi and welcome. All right, I'm still in town. I'm two days, T minus two, to get the freaking motorcycle course done. Hopefully it won't rain on Wednesday and I'll get it done. Uh, but uh, the show must go on and uh, I got to uh, still keep up to my, uh, you know, my work, so to speak, I guess. <laughs> so I took down a bunch of notes this time. Yeah, I'm, see how much more organized I'm getting? I got like this loose piece of paper with writing on it. Now, the big thing is, can I decode my own handwriting? Uh, I don't know where to start here. I guess I'll start on... Yeah. I don't have a lot here, but it's, you know, ongoing stuff, so we'll keep it going. So I guess I'll start with the 50 million, I believe it was 50 million, uh, USA going to uh, Lebanon, basically buying weapons for somebody. Not exactly sure who yet. Uh, it's obviously not going to be going to Hezbollah because uh, they're sided with the Iranians and whatever, and they're anti-Israel, so that type of thing. So uh, I do know that uh, Lebanon is a bit of a tug of war there, what's going on between the communist Lebanese army, which works with the Syrian Arab army, and uh, Hezbollah as well. They, they, they work in, you know, on one side, and then, of course, I guess you've got other factions on the other side. So... Who's in Lebanon that would be uh, uh, getting money from the, the U.S. Uh, to, to get the weapons? I don't know. And I guess it's things like oh, artillery guns and stuff like that. Because I guess not enough weapons have fallen into the hands of ISIS yet. So they're going to put more in there, right? So that type of thing. So uh, that's what's going on there. And oh, yeah. Uh, it's a Russian name. And like most Russian names, I can't pronounce it. Uh, it is the chief of staff, Sergei Lavanov, if I said it right. Uh, basically, uh, this guy did want to become, an, uh, I guess, an oligarch or whatever, and he said, fire me after so many years and stuff like that. So Putin uh, decided to uh, do that. And Putin gave him praise and stuff like that. And this guy, again, is one of, uh, you know, chief of staff. So he's, you know, military advisor and stuff like that. And, uh, pretty high up there. So, again, a completely different approach to Obama, where Obama has basically fired more U.S. personnel than any president in history, and pretty much basically uh, weeded the garden and, and did uh, you know a complete purge of the military is what Obama done. Now, Putin has been doing that too. In a few, a little while back, I was talking about how uh, they got rid of men that would not push the button. Uh, so the Russians, are, they're serious when it comes to, uh, when it goes down. They know at some point this is going to go down, so they need the most dedicated guys possible. But you got to watch out, because that's where you get your psychos as well. Yeah, yes, I will push button. Today? We push it today? You know, <laughs> How about tomorrow? We do tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon. Yes, we, we, we have nuclear war now. You know, can we do it today? <laughs> you know, it's like, no, no, you have to wait till the war starts. Why wait? <laughs> you know, it's like... That's the, that's the problem when you get these guys that are a little bit over-eager to uh, please uh, comrade. Yeah. <laughs> comrade coming up. Yeah. Um, next to that, Israeli rocket systems are going to uh, Vietnam. They're putting them in place with the threat that they are going to take out North Korean... Uh, if, you, if you know where Vietnam is, it's a long way from North Korea. And their goal is to take out North Korean uh, missiles and stuff like that, and missile sites. Uh, how, that means their missiles have to cross Chinese airspace. Uh, think of how insane that is. Now, the weird thing about Vietnam is just the idea that it wasn't all that long ago that the U.S. was blowing the shit balls out of Vietnam. But now they're the best thing since sliced bread, right? So you see how these allies change and stuff like that. There is no real loyalty or or real principle on U.S. foreign policy. It's who's the best for us at the time, right? Because usually once you to declare a country an enemy and you go to war with them, you pretty much keep them as an enemy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that. That's uh, you know you might re resume ties, but you don't start giving them military aid and stuff like that. And of course, why would Israeli rockets be going to Vietnam, right? Why is Israel even involved in this, right? So again, war is a racket. That's the main theme. So that's the, something to definitely keep uh, on. Now, uh, the Russians have also... Just got to watch where I'm walking so I don't get smucked by something. Uh, 
got warships in the Mediterranean, but they have now got these missiles on the warships. I can't remember the exact uh, designation of the missile. Uh, and like most Russian missiles, they're very versatile in the sense of we can blow the crap balls out of something or we can really blow the crap balls out of something. So nuclear, non-nuclear, that type of thing. Uh, they obviously have this in the Mediterranean with all the U.S. warships going back and forth provoking Russia. Again, there is real no case for U.S. warships to be in the Mediterranean. There really is no case. They're not going to... ISIS isn't floating around in little rowboats or anything like that. And, uh, you know, like there's really no case for it. Uh, so it is clearly just to pro keep provoking in the Mediterranean. So the Russians are definitely stepping up their grade here and saying, okay, yes, but our warships may possibly have nukes on them. And we know that uh, you've got, again, in the Crimea, you've got Topol M's coming in a whole, and I'll get to the Ukraine. I'll save the Ukraine for the last because there's so much to cover in the Ukraine this time. Um, again, to keep up with it all. But yeah, so that, that's definitely a statement when your warships, the cruise missiles, uh, you know, are nuclear capable. Uh, that, that's definitely a statement. So the Russians are saying, yes, you know, <laughs> you can come here, but uh, it won't work out well for you. So that type of thing. Next to that, uh, the uh, military industrial complex in the States, surprise, surprise, are asking for more funding. They're, they need more funding. Uh, well, here's the thing, okay, you have a lot of the U.S. military that is in crisis and stuff. Now, if they, like, who are they funding for? Like, are they funding for the U.S. military or funding everybody else? They, like, pick one, right? So, if the U.S. wasn't funding all, the, you know, giving Vietnam missiles and uh, giving uh, South Korea and all these, uh, the Philippines, if they weren't arming up everybody there, they would have more than enough for their own military. Uh, they will spread themselves, well, they already have kind of spread themselves too thin in the South Pacific, you know, in the South China Sea and all that. Um, but it, it's kind of like this, you know, this idea of we're going to arm everybody, but everybody's going to be armed so thinly. Like, it looks like a massive buildup, but when you look at it from a strategic point of view, um, it, it, you know, like, yes, it is a massive buildup, but everybody is, like, really spread apart. You know, uh, if you have, you know, missile system here and then 400 miles away, uh, you have another missile system, you're really starting to spread yourself thin. You know, like, you might have an overlap there, but you have a lot of gaps for the enemy to come in and take out your systems. Uh, and if they hit one system at a time kind of thing, it, it'll crumble faster than it can move. So I think that's how the Russians are going to play it, and I think that's definitely how the Chinese are going to play it. I still say the Chinese are going to most likely do an island hopping war when they do get into it, and the rhetoric from the Chinese in the last past two weeks has been pretty stepping up and getting pretty, you know, there's, you know, there's going to be a lot more rhetoric uh, before they just say, fuck off or we're going to war. You know, like there's a lot more that's going to happen. We, we know this. But there's a lot of accidental things that can happen too. And again, the more this stuff is spread out, the more uh, potential for a cursed style incident uh, can happen, right? So these are the things that we have to watch out for. Oh. Uh, next to that, yeah, so, uh, South Korea has also, uh, said that, uh, they're getting ready for their missile sites to take out all the North Korean possible missile sites. Now, North Korea really isn't that much of a threat. Like, uh, as much as they, 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 like, they don't really have anything that can get outside their borders very far. To South Korea, yes, that's a different statement altogether. Yes, they can go at it with South Korea. I still would say, if everything was left alone just between North Korea and South Korea, I still say with the military technology difference, South Korea would probably wipe the map with North Korea in the long run, but not without extremely heavy losses. Like, I, the North Koreans are deadly on their border because they have a lot of artillery, they got a lot of manpower, that type of thing. So you'll incur losses, there's no doubt about that. Because things about the North Koreans is they don't stay put. Uh, they, they still use the old rush the position communist ideology that, uh, you know, they're not like the Taliban or something like that that hides up in the hillsides with the caves, do hit and run tactics. I mean, they'll do some of that stuff. They still have that old Soviet, you know, rush the position, which really does come back to the German, 
Germans in World War II with their Blitzkrieg. So the Russian spin-off of the Blitzkrieg, basically, uh, in the 1950s, of basically, if you have ten men, you might lose nine of them, but by the time those guys go to reload, you're right on top of them and jabbing them with your bayonet. They still have that kind of mentality in a lot of their stuff. Their special forces guys might be a little bit more modern, but they don't have a lot of special forces guys. So that said, yeah, North Korea would probably take a, a hell of a pounding for a day or two, uh, but they would be wasting through North Korean troops so fast that any of the, the gains that they would get, they would lose on the second, third, fourth, fifth offensive. You know, they're just not going to have... Uh, it'll be a blaze of glory <laughs> for the North Koreans for sure. Uh, but, um, yeah, they, they definitely won't be able to take the North Koreans in, in, in it. In that. But then again, it also depends on how the, the, the South Koreans fight. If they fight more with U.S. tactics and uh, NATO tactics, which that's what they would be training with, they're probably going to be more of a defensive tactics, obviously, because of where they are. They can't retreat anywhere. Technically, the North Koreans, if they make well with the Chinese, they could retreat to China. Uh, I mean, that's where they came from kind of in the first place. Uh, that, that whole regime comes in from China, you know, when you really track the history of it. Yes, there are North Koreans are not Chinese, I know that. But the, the, the thing is, is that uh, North Korea wasn't a communist country until China decided it was a communist country, you know what I mean? That type of thing. Uh, you know, I mean, there was a little bit of, uh, I mean, you can look at the history, like, there was a little bit of uh, give and take there, sure, like, they didn't really put up that much of a fight, they just kind of came in, and whatever, ethnically cleansed anybody that uh, didn't agree with the uh, the communist uh, utopia, uh, you know, you know, so that, that's kind of what happened with North Korea, and then it just turned into this nightmarish of a, of a place, uh, the poor people there, and again, is like, can you even help the people there, how brainwashed are they, like, you know what I mean? Like, they, they're just so far gone that the, you know, like, these people are really living in some, like, you, you couldn't even take them out of the country that, like, in high numbers. When North Korean people make it, you know, across the uh, the landmines or whatever and get out, a lot of times when they get into, if they go to the United States or they go maybe here, Canada, where, they don't know what to do because their whole life, their government has told them every single aspect of life how to, how to live. So they don't know how to live. And they would probably go crazy in a place like this because it'd be like an ant getting out of an ant colony. It's like, what do I do? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, like they, they it's kind of, uh, I'll tell you the analogy of uh, somebody who goes into prison at, as a teenager comes out as an 85 year old man. What kind of world is he going to know? Like he's going to be asking permission to go to the bathroom. You know what I mean? Like he, he's not going to know what to do. He's going to be a fish out of water. So, like, can you really help these people? I don't know. But you could, if you could get rid of Kim Jong-un and, you know, at least get food to the people would be nice. But uh, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, but as far as South Korea knocking out North Korean missile system sites, well, right there does kind of eliminate the threat of North Korea altogether. Uh, the reason being is, again, North Korea does not have... They have a missile that perhaps does have the range to get to North America. They even have nukes that will explode on where they need them to explode. The problem you have is they can only do this trick once or twice. Then after that, there's nothing left to North Korea. Like the North Koreans, maybe some of them are that stupid and brainwashed, but most of them, I think, do understand that they have no chance in hell at winning a war. Even with their mighty Wida, Kim Jong-un with his pudgy fist, our favorite guy, um... But yeah, but the idea of, of the agitation of it, of South Korea saying, yeah, we're going to go ahead and preemptively strike you. Well, you know what? They should just keep that plan secret. Here's why. Because now you're going to rile them up again. You know what I mean? They're always looking for that. You know, it's kind of like that kid that comes up to you in school with the puts, try to give you a wet willy, put a finger in your and he doesn't touch you, he doesn't touch you, and you turn around, you smack him. And he looks at the teacher, he hit me for no reason. But he's been provoking you for three days. <laughs> you know I mean? Well, that's what we're doing with North Korea. That's what we're doing with Russia. That's what we're doing with China. So when they do snap, you know, like, it, we're, like the, it's when they finally had enough. That said, we, again, we have to consider that. Uh, I don't think the North Korean regime is that stupid. Uh, I think they just talk the talk. 
uh, for propaganda's sake because of the people that, like, for, I don't think Kim Jong-un actually believes uh, what he says. The reason why is simple. He was educated in Switzerland and stuff like that. Now, is he over-entitled? Is he an idiot? Is he a dictator? Is he a bad guy? Should he be taken out? Yeah, absolutely. But uh, the thing is, it's very simple. Uh, the people at the upper echelons, they know the difference. They know that communism is a failed system. But they've got everybody below them, especially using the North Korean weather lady. It's totally awesome. I'm not going to do it here because too many people. <laughs> then they'd really think I was nuts talking to my phone, doing a North Korean uh, weather lady uh, prediction. A nice Corvette. Nice vet. There we go. Uh, so, so yeah, no, no, no North Korean uh, weather lady uh, predictions today. Yeah, there we go. Uh, but anyway, uh, bottom line, uh, yeah, like it, the propaganda reaches the people, but it doesn't reach the, um, you know, the upper echelons. They know, you know, you know, like that, that's the thing. They, they they know the difference, so they know how far they can and cannot push it. And I don't think North Korea has really done anything over the line to the point where. They've actually jeopardized their own safety. They, they, they talk a big talk. They put on a display. Like, it takes them, like, two weeks to set up a, a ballistic missile. You know what I mean? Like, a, Russia can launch 4,500 in 18 seconds. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, who's, who's bluffing, right? Who's bluffing? So, that type of thing. So, when you're looking at it like that, it does change things in perspective that North Korea is simply not a threat, really, to in, the outside world. Maybe to regionally... They could probably do a bit of damage with their 50 submarines, whatever. Their ballistic missile subs may get lucky and take out an aircraft carrier or something like that. I really don't think they, they would fare out that well. Like, in the long term, obviously not. I think most people agree with that. So why are they so important? Well, they're important for a couple of reasons. Number one, they are the useful idiot to China. The North Korean regime was always kind of under the Chinese thumb. Now... How much are they under the thumb now? I don't know, because Kim Jong-un is a bit of a... You know, I mean, he took out his uncle and his aunt, uh, who were pretty much the, the, the ambassadors to China in the sense of, okay, we're going to put you in, in uh, you know, in charge as a, as a puppet. You know what I mean? Like, and he knew this. He knew this. So he had them taken out. So that's why you've even had China tell them, Tell the North Koreans, you know, mellow out or we're, we're going to smack you around ourselves. You, you know, you're making it dangerous for us now. Like, when we want you to agitate, we'll let you agitate. Uh, but till that time, like right now, China is doing what Russia is doing in a lot of ways. They're, they're trying to de-escalate to a degree, but they also have to show that they're, you know, they're not pushovers, right? So it's kind of that catch-22. If you don't respond to the U.S. provoking, they're going to move right in and you will have nothing to do about it. Uh, you know, you'll be twice as vulnerable in the long run. So they have to respond somehow. North Korea is one response they can use. Problem is, is North Korea is more of a useful idiot to China in the sense that they can use North Korea as the distraction. Basically, get the United States worried about North Korea when there's really no worry. I'm pretty sure most of the U.S. brass... Well, then again, you never know. Some of them are kind of stupid. Uh, you know, Obama's picks are not exactly what I would say were people I'd want to go to war with, uh, you know, or let alone try to plan out a war. Uh, because, again, anybody that, like, again, you never underestimate your, your, uh, your enemies because you, you never know. As bad, the, the biggest con could, could be North Korea. Think about it this way. We look at their army. It's all 1950s Soviet kind of copy stuff. I mean, they got their tactical uh, rocket tractors. Those things are awesome. I love those things. Okay, so you see that on the parade, and you see the their uh, KN-1 or K, uh, whatever uh, that ballistic missile is there. The paper mache looking one, uh, the one with the screws and the bolts missing on it. Uh, yeah, they've done that before, but you never know. Somewhere deep within the country, they could have the latest and greatest, newest versions of, of uh, Dangon... Uh, 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 Dongfang uh, 21s and Dongfang 11s. They could have all the latest and greatest Chinese uh, hardware, which is not too bad. They could have hypersonic missiles. They could have all that stuff. It wouldn't be theirs. It would be the, under the control of the Chinese. But you wouldn't know it was there. That's where that's where the con would be. It's like, while you're looking at it, like, if they were to sacrifice North Korea, they would say, okay, come on in, wipe them out, and then just clobber the shitballs at you with all this hidden 
military stuff that you wouldn't like. Uh, yeah, North Korea does have a, a MiG-29 or two. I think they got like eight of them or nine of them, whatever they got. And these are the older MiG-29, so they're clearly not, you know. But they could do things like send in, you know, the, the, the MiG-35s or something like that, paint them up as North Korean and not say nothing, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden, hey, now you've got really good pilots in there. Maybe send in some Chinese pilots or whatever. Or, you know, whatever they, they might do. It's hard to say. They could do it that way. And then that way they, they could take the upper hand in a kind of... Uh, how they would use this move and why they would use this move would be, again, it would be subjective to a few things. The, the first thing is, is they would have to use it. Uh, China would send North Korea to war before the United States gets to, gets to go to war with China. Why? Because, again, they're the useful idiots. So, okay, China will use North Korea. They'll stay out of it. And the Chinese like to do this. They like to kind of stay under the radar, stay out of it as much as they can. And if what they, were, they could do is get North Korea to fight NATO or whatever with all these, and just, like, back channels supply them with all these high-tech weapons. And, you know, with the North Korean propaganda, they, they're like ISIS. They, you know, they'll take credit for anything, right? You know, it's like if it looks like it's a win and it can make them look good, they'll use the propaganda, which again goes against them. Uh, they don't realize it. Well, maybe the upper uh, upper echelons do, but then again, that's where the the useful idiot status of North Korea comes into question. Did Kim Jong Un? I mean, he has knocked off like uh, Obama military purges. Basically, you're fired. You're fired. You're fired. Um, Kim Jong Un military uh, purges are basically. You know, let's have a parade, and we're going to execute a couple of guys in front of, you know, in front of everybody. I think that's what they do there. Like it's it's crazy. Uh, yeah. So if maybe the North Koreans are playing their own game, who knows? I really don't think they have that much control. I do believe China has mostly control over North Korea. Uh, but yeah, we'd have to wait to see. But yeah, China would definitely use North Korea as a distraction to invade the South, which would to give give China time to maybe, if they could get lucky, they would use it to strategically take out, say, U.S. warships. And in that's big threat. They're, everybody else in the region is not really that much of a threat to them, even other NATO members. Maybe Japan, Philippines to a degree, because of the, you know, the defending an island type of thing. Australia to a degree, because of the distance. Uh, but in the long run, there's really nothing to stop a Chinese Navy in that area. There's nothing to stop them at all, um, other than the U.S. Uh, I wouldn't say nobody could stop them. I mean, again, if uh, all those regions band together, yeah, China's got a fight on its hand. But on the other hand, too, is the, the you know if they they were going to go to a fight, they they're definitely going to take out the most threatening things first, and they've got these. New uh, satellite beams and stuff like that for communication that they're putting up that are basically un, un, uh, unhackable and stuff like that. So the Chinese are preparing for the war. They, they, they're getting ready for it. How good is their stuff? I don't know. I think it's like anything. Nothing, whether we're talking U.S., Russian, or Chinese, or anything that NATO owns, uh, is never good as good as advertised. Like, the F-22 is never as good as advertised. Uh, parts still fall off the... Uh, the Sukhoi uh, 30s, you know what I mean? Like that type of thing. They're never as good as advertised. They, you know, there are maintenance problems. There's this problem. There's that problem. Uh, uh, there's glitches in the radars. There, you know, all that type of stuff. But some stuff is a little more obvious than others. Now, as far as the F-35 being ready, combat ready, or one version of it being combat ready, uh, well, that's what they're telling us up here in Canada, so we stay with the program. Um, I don't think Trudeau's going to jump ship on the F-35. Yeah, he got elected on the idea of this fair fighter competition that he was going to do, which is what a government should have done in the first place. Uh, but the thing is, the no, he's not going to change. Like again, there's no difference really between uh, Trudeau and Harper in a lot of ways. Like they still work for the same Anglo-American Empire banking system and stuff like that. Like that, that's still the same system, that type of thing. So. Anyway, we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. Uh, yeah, so for South Korea to take out all the North Korean sites, that would be something interesting. 
Next is over there in Britain. Uh, Britain, there, uh, we had the new Prime Minister come out uh, when asked point blank, would you use nukes? Not under what circumstances would you use nukes, but just would you use the nukes if you had to? Uh, she said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Didn't even hesitate. You know, because, you know, and when you look at it, it's like, okay, well, shouldn't that be a little bit longer of a discussion? See, what they're looking for is the loyalty and stuff like that to the regime and whatever of, of, of the banking system that when we tell you to go to war and launch on Russia, you're going to launch on Russia, basically. Uh, and this new prime minister, I don't know much about her yet, but I, I'm pretty sure she's not going to be any better than Cameron. Uh, they usually never are when they're kind of just like appointed like that. Uh, well, I don't know if uh, she was appointed or elected. I, I, was, I was away that week, so I don't know exactly what happened. You guys can fill me in, so I don't want to put out misinformation on that. But I would say new boss, same as the old boss. But just the idea that when they're asking her in, uh, in, their, uh, in their parliament, you know, just like how quickly, like just no hesitation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, yes, I will use nukes. You know, like, uh, shouldn't you, you know, just adding a, a but, at least put on a bit of a show, only under the circumstances of we're being attacked and in defensive uh, purposes only. At least say something, like, at least bullshit a bit or something, you know. It's like, right now, Britons have got to be thinking, I, I know exactly what they're thinking. They're thinking, oh, well, that was interesting. Oh, fuck. <laughs> you know, like, that's what they're thinking, you know. It's like, you know, she's ready to just launch off nukes as if it was like the 4th of July or something, or the 1st of July. Uh, you know, that type of thing, like an Independence Day, yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah, just launch those, uh, yeah, yeah, let's, let's ring in the Chinese New Year with a few nukes, why not? Uh, yeah. So, um, that said, the Brits, their military is, like anything, has always been kind of, uh, it's been a bit cash-starved, stuff like that. It's not a huge military. One thing I do like about the Brits is they are very innovative with their stuff. Sometimes they make things a little more complicated than they need to be, uh, but they do, for the most part, build really good things like Eurofighter. I mean, Eurofighter, yes, was a joint effort, kind of how the F-35 was supposed to be a joint effort, but the difference is the Eurofighter actually worked. Uh, as good as advertised, yes and no. A Eurofighter does have a few problems. It is a bit heavy for what it is. It's, uh, you know, 40,000 pounds empty. Uh, uh, however, the thing can get off the ground in five seconds, which is pretty damn impressive. I don't know of another combat jet that can do that. Now, with a combat load, I don't know. Um, does it need some upgrades? Well, Eurofighters are getting old too, and, and, and what, what have you. But they are a good, a good jet, there's no doubt about that. Uh, they, 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 they'll serve the purpose of the RAF and the German Luftwaffe, and uh, I think Spain and Italy use them as well. Everybody's kind of, you know, nobody's really saying anything bad about the Eurofighter. It's just, like anything, you have to keep up with the times. So, if you're building these things, you really have to make sure that uh, you can maintain them and you can have enough of them. That's where the problem with Eurofighter is. The same thing with the F-22. You just can't build enough of them. So, you know, when you think about the MiG-21, okay? When Eurofighter came out, it was basically... Still going with the idea of taking out MiG 29s and MiG 20, uh, Sukhoi 27s and stuff like that. I also, as a multi rolled fighter. Now, like all multi rolled fighters, there's always handicaps. With Eurofighter, it is maneuverable, but I wouldn't say it's as maneuverable as the Rus their Russian counterparts. Uh, yeah, they'll, uh, you know, they'll shoot down MiG 21s in the handfuls, but the problem is, is for every one Eurofighter, there's probably a hundred plus to one. MiG-21s, not that the Russians are really using MiG-21s anymore, but just as an example, um, you know, there was 13,000 MiG-21s, and some of them are still getting upgrades, believe it or not, yeah, they keep these things in the air, uh, because you can fly a MiG-21 100 hours with, without doing any maintenance to it, like, it, it's really ridiculously how simple these airplanes are, they'll get the job done in, you know, third world countries, that type of thing, that said, they're putting, you know, newer radars and stuff like that so you got an old airframe that's simple to maintain maybe not as powerful whatever but you put a modern electronics in there and radar and you know stuff like that it, it could be lethal now why is that important well because there was 13,000 of those made uh in sukhoi 30s which is a complete technological marvel 
over the, uh, where the hell, and where's the trail here? It's all muddy, it rained here the other day, so I think I'm, all, I'm in the mud. I don't want to be in the mud. Uh, so you got this technological marvel of a machine that is cheaper than an F-15, uh, is capable of doing all kinds of stuff. It's a long-range fighter, bomber, slash, escort, whatever you want, whatever you want the SU-30 to be, it can be that for you. And the other thing about it is, uh, there, there's a, quite a, you know, there's a few hundred of those things out there. Eurofighters, there's not really not that many Eurofighters out there. So that's just an example of some of the problems. Same with the Challenger tanks. Uh, there's not that many of them out there. You don't have that many Eurofighters. You don't have that many Challengers. Uh, uh, the Warriors, whatever their APCs are. So the Britons don't really have a lot in comparison to the Russians. And the reason why this is important is because they're basically right now putting their full doctrine on going with the idea of taking on Russia alone. Yes, I said that. Uh, I, I had the same reaction when I heard that too. That they want to basically be on par with the Russians. So A, they either, if they have, because again, Britain isn't really that big of a country. Um, not only geographically, but just people-wise. To the point where, for them to match Russia on par with equipment, A, they either have to build extremely cheap equipment, like a crap load of uh, MiG-21s or something like that, uh, to, to match the numbers, which would do them no good, because the Russians are now building SU-30s and SU-35s and, uh, you know, Pac F-A-50s, MiG-35s, uh, etc., you know, which is a derivative of the MiG-29. Uh, and, you know, like the Russians are now... You know, they're in that status of basically building top quality fighter jets. Uh, maybe still crude in some areas, but for the most part, they're building top quality fighter jets. At last count, I don't know how many they've, they've sold off, but they had at least 600 MiG-29s. You know, the way the Russian Air Force was designed in the 90s hasn't really changed that much. It's changed a bit because the equipment's changed. Uh, they got about 180 uh, SU-34s, which will be a big problem for NATO. Uh, these are electron. These are basically uh, the SU-24 on steroids. Uh, out of the 6,500 SU-24s, uh, there's still 1,500 of those in service. Now, a Eurofighter will fly circles around one of those, sure. But they're not going to be able to take on these things in the droves. And, like, you know, now you need to rely on the tornadoes. Again, Britain doesn't have that many tor tornadoes in service. They, have a, they probably have more than everybody else, but they don't have very much. And if you're, you know, if you know, you know what the stats are. I know some of you guys are British military, so tell us what you got. Uh, but to, again, the, the point here is to match, you know, tornadoes to SU-34s and SU-24s to match Eurofighters to SU-35s, uh, MiG-29s, SU-27s. I mean. They're going to be outnumbered 50 to 1. <laughs> you know, like there's at least uh, 1,600 uh, uh, SU-27 Sukhoi variants. Little Suzuki Savage or whatever. Um, yeah, so right there, you got a problem. Now, one of the best fighters I think Britain ever had, although it was more of an attack aircraft, was the Harrier. I don't know why they ever got rid of that for the freaking F-35. The Harrier worked. Very proven. Yeah, maybe not the most uh, inexpensive thing to, to fly. Very cool airplane. I got to sit in one before. Well, I got to sit in. Well, I got to sit in the uh, GR3 and the AV8A. Uh, the AV8A is the American version. And uh, what I got to say about those airplanes is um, they're probably like the most commonsensical, uh, if that's a word. Uh, attack airplane you could ever design. I'm going to go down here and sit down here. Uh, it's freaking hot out here today. So, yeah, they'll have to pull a lot of stuff out of mothballs, but again, now you've got older equipment going up against newer Russian equipment. So, and Navy-wise, well, no comparison there. Uh, British Navy, you know, again, uh, they're good pilots, they're good sailors, just not enough of them. Same problem we have here in Canada, there's just not enough of us. Uh, the Russians are, you know, way ahead in the sense that they've went from 2010 when they had a one million man army 
And this is something to consider, that they now have a four, or just about a four million man army, in only six years. Uh, and they're not, you know, they, they, they that, that's a big leap. You know, that's a big leap to go on par with that. Obviously the Britons can't, they don't have the budget to do that, especially at their cost. Like the Russians don't build stuff expensive. They build it, uh, you've got these uh, engineers making mi minimum wage, but they're doing what they like to do. So when you're looking at it like that, it is a totally different. I don't know how their their generals came up with that, but that's what they are. Uh, you know, that, that's what they're talking about. Anyway, I don't know how they pull it off economically. They're, you know, again, the British economy isn't you know the most you know staggering economy economy out there either. How would they pull this off? There's just no way for them to pull this off. Okay, uh, now I, I've only got a little bit of snippet on this one. I don't know too much about it. But it looks like uh, Putin is pulling out of the peace talks for the Ukraine, which makes sense because there is no peace talks, really. It's just, you know, <laughs> it's a coup, right? So it's like, a, I guess he's just tired of putting on that show. Um, and over there in Syria, there's a... The Russians are talking about actually putting boots on the ground so that they don't lose all the gains because the rebels have been making... A few strides, uh, not really pushing anybody back, but they don't want to lose the ground they've already got, right? So, and a few weeks ago, Bashar al-Assad said it best that, you know, ISIS is going to fall in the next couple of weeks. Watch for the terrorist attacks. There was, again, another knife attack or something like that this time in Switzerland. It just, uh, you know, never ends, right? So, that type of thing. Uh, hmm, sorry, just a little bit of a distraction here. Uh, that type of thing. Uh, next one goes... Uh, yes, I would like. You know, <laughs> I don't, don't want to be called a perv or something, so I can't can't show you the nice looking girl. Though I'll go down this way. Oh, this way. Uh, anyway, okay. So the next one is this one goes. Uh, yeah, to the Ukraine again. This one is basically. This one's kind of a nerving one. There, it's a group called the Surveillance Saboteurs or something like. It's a weird name, like something like along that along that lines, right? And basically, it was twenty guys on the Russian border uh, from the Ukraine trying to plant explosives. This now this could be a, an SF, FSB ploy too. You never know. The Russians do fight dirty. We know this. But uh, that said. The Russians have said this could put us into full-scale war with the Ukraine. That, I think, the reason, the reason why I don't think this is a Russian ploy is because that's what they're trying to avoid. That's the whole coup was to put Russia into a full-scale war with Ukraine to wear down the Russian troops so NATO could sweep in after. Again, Eastern Europe has been slated for destruction by the Anglo-American Empire, basically, so that, you know, while uh, Russia's fighting... Finland and Poland and, and Hungary and, and uh, you know, uh, Slovakia and Romania and Ukraine and where, wherever else, uh, Lithuania and all that, uh, by the time NATO comes in, the Russians have got nothing left. Now, the FSB basically caught this, and they basically arrested 20 guys. I think one Russian guy was killed. Uh, pretty crazy stuff. Now, in response, the Russians have sent, you guessed it, a whole... And they've been moving stuff by train, uh, which makes sense. That's nothing new. Moving uh, mili heavy military equipment by train has always been something uh, been going on. That's how you move tanks, you know what I mean? Tanks get like 10 gallons to the mile type of thing at best, you know? So it's like, okay, well... Uh, can I go down this way? Uh, too many people. I'll go the other way. A whole bunch of people on the beach. I'm at the beach, eh? So, at West Pro Beach. So. Uh, so, yeah, so now, last week or whatever, I didn't get a chance to report on. There was a whole bunch of, looks like, topal lambs and everything. And again, Russia said its response to uh, these kind of, if, it, you know, people keep up on these kind of responses, i.e., the Ukraine, U.S. military, or, you know, Anglo American Empire kind of things, they could fully respond. They show, you know, topal lambs as the, the response to uh, these. But these little excursions is more for sabotage or anything. So they're not, the Russians aren't going to go to war because a few people get killed 
on a border town center. They're not going to do that. They're not, they're not that short-sighted. Uh, they never have been. They never will be. So, uh, bottom line, they've got now attack helicopters uh, going to be flying up and down the, and, and increasing presence on that area there, too, for sure. And, uh, ah, nice day the beach. Uh, still no swimming. There's too much bird poop in the water. So I'm at a beach and you can't swim. That sucks. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so yeah, so they're basically, in a nutshell, going to have, I guess, probably KA-50s, the, whether it's the uh, Hawkum, the Werewolf, or the Black Shark, uh, KA-52 alligators. These are their kind of more high-tech stuff. I don't know if they're going to have any ha uh, Hawkum MIA, MIL 28s there or anything like that. So they're going to have a few things like that out there. And they're going to be flying around on that border in the Ukraine. Uh, as well as a whole bunch of barrage of tanks and you guessed it, they're all heading there too. So That's ah, a nice day today. But anyway, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much what I got. Uh, the more interesting one is the, is the border. The, the border of the Ukraine really does worry me more because what's probably going to happen is oops, after you that's okay i'm just blocking yeah. so what's more of a, a concern is the, the buildup uh, in the crimea we know there's nukes there we know there's uh you know they got like topol m there whatever but now you have more of an uh, a possibility of a clash right on the border so with attack helicopters or whatever. Now, obviously there is military tanks uh, from the Ukrainian uh, Kiev-1 and Kiev-2 that are moving around in that area, as well as the Azov Battalion. I mean, these guys haven't left, right? They're, they're, they're still there. But this also gives Russia more excuse to uh, put a tighter death grip on, on uh, Ukraine... Uh, economically, I mean, Ukraine right now economically is already destroyed anyway. But uh, the, the case in point is now what they can do is really tighten the screws. So, they, you know, the Russians, they're going to have their border completely locked up anyway. So, obviously, if a handful of guys can't sneak across the border, uh, you know, th th they've got it locked up pretty good. But it also shows how tense things are. Again, uh, even if you were to measure towards the Cuban Missile Crisis, like this is a really should be all over the mainstream news, but it, it, of course it's not going to be because, again, the one system, right? And we always have to look at the world. It's hot out here. Uh, yeah, some pretty girls back on the beach. I'll say that. I get a bit distracted while doing that. That's how dedicated I am to my job. Pretty girls on the beach, and I'm still blogging. Uh, so the the case in point is this: uh, you now have. A situation where I'm going to sit down, <laughs> get some water. Freaking hot! Didn't expect it to get that hot that quick. Uh, where the Russians are basically, you know, twice as paranoid because they now have stuff coming across their border, which I think was Plan A in in, in the first place. I mean, it's pretty openly admitted on even, you know, uh, that. Regime change was done in the Ukraine by the United States. There's, there's nobody that can really deny it. There's, you know, that is the U.S. foreign policy slash Greater Israel Project foreign policy. The U.S. foreign policy is the Israeli policy and vice versa. It's one system. The banking system is the media system. The media system is the education system. The education system is the military system. The military system is the economy. The economy, and it goes and it goes and it goes. And it's all linked. So it's all one system. And remember, the United States has a death and debt based economy. I, I keep repeating this. Max Kaiser said it. I think it was so elegantly put as that, that they can't stop this stuff. If they do, the economy implodes. But with the Ukraine, it's kind of a weird thing that they've got going on, where they're beefing up Poland, not the Ukraine. So the Ukraine really has been pretty much forsaken by all sides. However, all the Russians have to do is sit and wait. They're going to get it eventually. That will be uh, the East Ukraine, West Ukraine, pretty much like I've been saying is going to happen, pretty much happen. And the the problems with that, oh, just Hi. just blogging. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the problem with that is 
obviously the Ukrainian people are going to suffer the most. So, with that said, right now you don't really hear as much rhetoric on the news about Ukraine. I think the the, the Anglo-American Empire is kind of they're, they're they're going back to something else. They're going to try to try to come out in a different way. They never stop, but they're, it's always an ongoing tug of war here. But they're like, well, we can't get the the Russians have it. You know, the Russians have it. There, there's whether you like it or not, the Russians have it. But the Russians saw this coming, like you know, five million miles away. Like I mean, uh, again, they they all they have to do is sit and wait. Uh, again, not that I trust Putin. I know I got a lot of Putin fans out there too. Uh, you know, I mean, Russia's just as corrupt as any anyone else, anywhere else, and in some ways even more. But you know, government-wise, but li- like anything, the difference is that. Uh, they're actually on the winning side on a lot of things because what all they have to do to make the Anglo-American Empire look bad is tell the truth. It's the weirdest thing. Like, they just have to expose the truth. Uh, and, you know, that, that kind of gives them an upper hand. It's, a weird, it's the weirdest thing. Uh, whereas on the Anglo-American Empire, all they have to do, all they keep doing is lying and lying and lying. I mean, and with the, the elections going on with Hillary Clinton... Uh, and just lie after lie, and you know, he got all these uh, people now kind of getting dropping dead, <laughs> you know, around the Clintons and stuff like that. So people are just seeing it for what it is. But the thing is, is that uh, the, the Russians are not going to be any better off in the long run uh, to, to maintain this uh, without lying themselves, right? Like they have to kind of lie themselves because if they don't. Uh, what are they got? What are they got to lie about? Well, other things on their end. I, I haven't been following the Russian side quite as much because I live over here. Uh, the missiles are going to be flying my way too. You know what I mean? So I'm more of concerned about what we do about our politicians. Let the Russian people deal with their politicians how they, they see fit. Uh, that said, at some point, yes, these politicians. Right now, again, panic rooms. Uh, Doomsday bunkers, all that. they're buying this stuff in the droves. Uh, they, they, they really are terrified. They really are terrified. Now, some of them aren't because they're, they're complete, utter psychopaths. But, obviously, you know, I, I think most people are starting to get it. You know, you have bank after bank that keeps getting bailed out, that keeps failing. And they keep saying that, you know, it's like too big to fail. Oh, if we don't, let, if we don't bail out the banks, the whole world will collapse. And in some ways they're right, but the thing is, is we can never recover until we let the banks collapse. But they would rather, uh, they don't want to be blamed for it, so the, the goal is if we can go to war, then we can let the economy collapse. Now, the problem with this is very simple. The, the Russians, for them to win the big prize, they just have to stay out of a war. You know, same with the Chinese. They just have to stay out of the war. Let the United States collapse on itself. Um, and I think the Russian endgame uh, is, is the same as the Chinese. When the civil uprisings and civil wars, race wars, whatever you want to talk about in the States, I mean, right now you got Black Lives Matter attacking people if they're white, uh, driving around in cars. I forget where, where their protest was. And again, this is George Soros-funded stuff. So all these people, like, I mean, their names are known now. Uh... I don't know what they're going to do because really do they think that the legal system is going to protect them that much longer? Like, do, you know, like, yeah, like, I mean, in the sense of, yeah, they'll never go to jail, uh, most likely legally. I mean, look at Hillary Clinton. She should have went to jail, what, four times last week? <laughs> you know what I mean? That type of thing. So, yeah, it'll protect them that way. But all these people uh, that protect these people are the same as, tra- as traitors. Uh, they're going to be lynched as well. Like, they, they must realize this. I'm not making any threats. I'm just like, think of it logically. So self-preservation tells me, be a whistleblower. <laughs> That's, uh, but whistleblower is dangerous. I get it. Yeah. But um, at some point, like, when things really do start falling apart, um, it's going to be one of those things that people are going to be blaming everybody for everything, right? But more importantly, the people who know what's going on, call them spooks with a conscience, call them hellhounds, call them vigilantes, whatever you want to refer to them as, they will be coming out in massive droves, kind of behind the scenes. 
very 007 James Bond stuff. I think that's taking place now. Uh, if you're looking at all, you know, watch the world elites, watch people around the world elites just dropping dead. And we've seen, what, three people drop dead, dead around Hillary Clinton last past week. Uh, to me, I still say, yes, she's going to win the election. But if she can maintain, if her and her oligarchy can maintain the, uh, the illusion, if they can't maintain the illusion, it all falls apart. So there is a, you know, a possibility of a wild card there. Uh, now, when she wins the election, I think it shows the sham that the system is. Uh, yes, you've got the idiots that will vote for Hillary Clinton because they are that stupid. And yes, there's the people that are ignorant. And I, and I do separate stupidity from ignorance. Um, you know, people who don't follow channels like this have no idea how corrupt these people really are. But subconsciously, you know they know. Most of them know. So at that point, you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, are you going along with it just to keep your job? And if so, then you're a traitor to your own country. It's that simple. It really is that simple. And what do you think the penalty for treason is going to be in a pitchfork resolution? Again, not making any threats, but just think about it historically. Uh, anybody that was on the side of Group A or B, and history always being written by the winners, what happens to Group B, the ones that lose? Like, what happens to them? What happens to the people that supported them because they were just following orders or whatever? Or I was just doing my job. Well, no, technically you weren't. Uh, the FBI agent that pretty much, uh, or the CIA agent, whichever douchebag it was, that gave Hillary Clinton, or the uh, Department of Justice guy that gave Hillary Clinton a pass on the email thing. Saying, well, we did. there's no punishment really. So we did all this trial, cost the taxpayers a fortune. Prove that this woman was a criminal, but because we like her and we're donating to her campaign, which, why is a justice system doma donating anything to a campaign? They're taking taxpayers' fund money and donating it. <laughs> you know, government's donating to government. You can't do that. <laughs> I mean, really. Uh, yeah, so these people, what happens to them? Well, I did it because, I did it because, because, because you're a traitor. <laughs> you know, it's that simple. So what happens when there's vigilante justice everywhere and people know names and pictures? This is where we're different from World War II, where most people didn't know what the Nazi war criminals looked like. And there were, you know, like anything, uh, a lot of things that, yes, may have been fa fabricated about, about World War II. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that. And yes, like all wars, they're bankers' wars. Uh, but at the end of the day, Tracking those people down to gears. Now it's, you can get a, you know, pick a pick a prominent oligarch and read their profile online. Now, yeah, but the the system will go down. You don't think people have already thought about that of not like taking names, numbers, pictures, making files on these people? Of course they are. I mean, that's what these people do for a living. Now I'm talking about active duty law enforcement and military. Now listening to Phil Rhodes on Next News there. Uh, again, by the time you see this video, it'll be probably a few days old, but uh, he was talking about civil war in the United States, and something I've been talking about is, as well, like, it, it's going to be, it's going to be a slaughter fest when that kicks off. Now, as big as the U.S. military is, there's no way they can handle, an, uh, uh, no country can handle, handle a populist uprising, period. Um, doesn't matter how many CT cameras they have, Stones, Trump, uh, CT cameras. It doesn't matter how many bullets you have in your in your tank or in your gun or whatever, or in your MRAPs, whatever. It doesn't matter. Those things run out of gas. They run out of bullets. They run out of all these things. And because of that, you're going to be getting, like anything, they're going to get you on the reload. It's a human wave that will be coming for these people. So you could either be against the people or you could try to save this system. That's really not savable anyway. It's going down in front of us. I mean, really, if you look at these World War III updates that I've been doing for years now, uh, you're really seeing the escalation into a major conflict. You're, you're seeing that. And of course, you know, Obama, the, the, the Peace Prize winner, has just started, you know, put more boots on the ground in another country, you know, over there in Africa. So again, yeah, endless wars. Why? Because that is the, that is the U.S. economy. Now the people, most of the people aren't for this, but one thing uh, Phil Rhodes said is, uh, the country is so divided now, that all these Trotskyite, uh, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, communist type people uh, that love Hillary Clinton and all that, 
they they have this illusion that they're going to be able to in a you know through and most communists think this way is violent revolution. Now, cultural Marxism teaches violent revolution uh, by basically tear it down. Uh, you know, Frankfurt School of Thought. You know, uh, tear down, deconstruct, and question everything uh, from the from the perspective of a cultural Marxist or a Marxist in general. Uh, and that's the way many think. But the problem, what they don't realize, is when they're thinking as a you know overthrow the right wingers or whatever, because that's who they, they've been demonized to go after, right? Now, uh, you'd say, yeah, but the other side's going to do this. No, you, you, you really, look, the reason why you don't have the so-called deadly right-wingers that you keep hearing about uh, on the DHS uh, terrorist watch lists and stuff like that, constitutionalists and, and, you know, religious people, gun owners, all that, Second Amendment people, the reason why you haven't seen a big uprising from them is because they don't cast the first stone. Libertarians don't cast first stones. They turn the other cheek until... It's time not to turn the other cheek. Now, the problem with these communists is they're always casting stones. They're always agitating, Sololinsky-style tactics, useful idiots, whatever they might be. I used to refer to them as communist students. People call them social justice warriors now. And the 99% of them are really just a bunch of babbling idiots, and they're really not a threat to you at all. But where the problem is, is your real revolutionary 1919 <laughs> kind of... Kind of uh, mentality, Bolshevism kind of uh, communists, they do like to burn things, they do like to break things, they do like to destroy. Their, their whole makeup is nihilism. Tear it all down. Reconstruct it in my name. But they never get to the reconstruct it in our image. They always get to tear it down and they get addicted to tearing it down. That's why you got guys like George Soros, which always funds death and destruction. Uh, Black Lives Matter, new Nazis in the Ukraine to overthrow a country and pick another country. Anywhere George Soros money goes, death and destruction follows. So, now, the problem with most of these useful idiots, um, and I think Philip Rhodes says the best, he goes, these people, if they, you know, they've got to be careful what they wish for. When they think that they're just going to come in and, and, and you know, run out, like right now, it's, it's sociably, sociably, maybe not up here in Canada, like up here in Canada, we're, we're not going through the same crazy stuff yet as you are in the states but we're, we're we're a different country in a lot of ways although you know we have a lot of similarities culturally and stuff like that there are a lot of we're not as divided up here yet um but we you know our situation quite isn't as quite as bad as the states economically yet so we're we're, we're heading there but we're, we're just eight to ten years out same with europe we're like eight to ten years behind their problems but we're doing the same things we're just doing it slower but the thing is, is with these, uh, I'll just finish up with these, you know, these, these communist revolutionaries. When they start attacking right-wing establishments, which they're, they're in the early throes of it. Uh, you see it with Black Lives Matter attacking white people all over the place. You see it with these, um, uh, I'm not blaming all white, black people or anything like that. I'm not doing that. It's just, it is what it is. So I'm just the messenger. So call me racist, bigot, whatever you want. It doesn't really matter because it, it's, it's happening. You know, you can call me racist, bigot. But all I have to do is look at the body count, <laughs> you, know, you know, draw your conclusion from there. Uh, at some point, there's going to be a, a pushback. Now, I do agree with Philip Rhodes on the idea that, yes, these Trotskyite, useful idiot, student, communist student types are going to get their asses massively kicked by a very, very heavily armed right-wing populace or libertarian populace or nationalist populace. They're going to, they're going to be killed. They're going to be lynched. Uh, and they don't even see it coming, but that's the whole thing about nihilism. You don't see your end coming, right? Uh, you're not, you're, you're, it's Emperor Nero effect. You can't do that. Uh, so with that said, that could lead to a different type of regime on the opposite side to an extremely authoritarian right-wing regime that would be just as bad as any communism in, in, or whatever. So obviously civil war would be put on the map Big time. Now, the leftists, they, they just scream and yell. They're never going to be a military threat. But divided-wise, they, they are... They could be, the long con could be the secession movements throughout the United States, and then China can come in and buy up each state, pick them off one at a time over the next 200 years. So that could be the long con that, that, that's going on right now. But that can't happen until everything is deconstructed. This is where Hillary Clinton comes in. 
Why? That's what Saul Alinsky's agitation... She's an agitator just like Obama was. Like, there's no difference between Obama and Clinton, really. Uh, different oligarchy, but same boss, same plan, that type of thing. So I'm going to leave it at that. I, well, there's always stuff I'm missing, but anyway, I'll leave it at that. So if you like this kind of content, please consider making a donation channel. Links down below. Thank you so much, everybody. Chinese 剛剛他那時候一個叫南國的訓練班就完了 錢變了不是一個問題 如果在小事公司做學員的時候 Gums 所以我覺得我們那時候訓練出來的那批<笑> 但是徐宗信我認識他很久 
南拳南派嘅，啊唐佳嗰邊咧就北派嘅。咁北派嗰邊咧就通常識翻關鬥嘅，佢哋舞台舞台嗰邊嘅。咁徐宗信應該係唐佳嗰邊，因為佢係。係識翻翻關鬥嘅，佢係粉菊花嗰邊嘅應該，我都識佢好耐嘅。生死決入邊嘅動作咧，就係當時嘅年代叫做創新，佢嘅節奏比較快。佢嘅招式冇話好似劉家良嗰種文錯嘅一招一式啊，嚇或者一英槍一擺一彈彈出嚟，佢唔係嗰一種，佢係比較花啲，佢係求嗰、那個誒、呃、畫面嘅嘅視覺享受感，啪啪啪啪啪，佢速度節奏，佢唔係求俾觀眾睇一招一式，佢係成個過程佢嘅佢嘅打法，咁變咗我誒、呃、我拍。咁多動作片，即係由邵氏、劉家良、唐佳咁多師傅教出嚟，誒嘅打嘅節奏嘅嘢，同佢嘅完全唔同。咁但係呢個戲之前，我喺 ATV 入面已經同佢合作咗兩個戲，一個就係《沈聖依》電視劇，一個就係《天殘變》。我已經同佢接觸咗兩次，所以我變咗呢個喺電影上面再接觸佢嘅打法。係完全冇問題，只不過係將個方式轉去，係用日本嘅刀法去打，唔係打中國嘅嘢咁解。同中國嘅嘅劍術嘅打法係完全唔同嘅，因為、呃、中國嘅劍術係以單手為主，日本嘅劍術係以兩隻手揸一把刀，同埋佢嘅打法係完全同中國嘅打法唔同，因為中國嘅劍咧係打温柔打瀟灑嘅，除非係打刀。咁變咗日本嘅刀呢，係要打得好有力、好有 powerful 咁，雙手咁斬落去嗰種嘅。咁變咗武術指導呢，就係當年係好出名嘅程小東，但係佢係第一部做導演，程小東嘅第一部做誒電影導演。咁變咗佢係兼顧埋做武術指導。咁佢變咗佢攞好多日本片嘅片集嘅嘅打法俾我睇。即係誒冇冇人教，但係睇咗自己去吸收佢嘅佢嘅打法嘅刀去到邊，去到點樣收打完之後點樣起，即係嗰啲動作全部要睇。睇完之後我就吸收完，就係、是、咁樣拍翻出嚟，做翻出嚟，好辛苦嗰、那個戲，好辛苦。喺呢個生死決入面咧，如果導演同我講解呢個戲咧，就冇中嘅奸嘅，亦都冇好同壞嘅。如果要講中，呢、這個日本人係比對方更加中，佢係好剛嘅中，為國家，只要嗰個將軍叫佢一定要做到呢件事，佢係忠於國家，係即係違反咗自己嘅原則，佢都會做得到。即係佢如果要講中間，根本呢個戲冇中間，導演係咁樣同我解釋嘅。即係佢話：我只要用到好中咁，忠於國家，日本國家係為國家代表去打，用咁嘅心態係冇反派啊、冇奸啊嗰種嘅。只不過係大家用嘅方式唔同，即係等於今日做生意咁，你你會不擇手段咁賺錢啊嘛。咁我賺到錢就中啊，唔係唔係一定嘅，或者即係即係個手法唔同。咁佢佢引導我去去呢個角色就係冇話邊個係正派或者反派。其實如果要講正派嘅兩個都正派，大家都係各為其主，係只不過係後來我唔打唔得，我一定要誒攞咗呢個榮耀返去日本。咁我就不擇手段咁去去求對方打。其實呢個戲都唔係以打為主嘅，個個文戲個個骨幹都非常之好嘅，係講即係兩邊嘅心態。包括做人啊，包括要求嘅慾望啊，好多嘢喺度。生死決呢個戲咧，就喺香港開拍，就韓國外景。韓國外景完咗翻嚟，再剪完片之後，再繼續喺香港拍。成個戲要成六個月。即係如果以我哋香港嗰個年代嘅電影製作嚟講，六個月已經係算好長，因為一般我哋四個月，啊，除非係叫做好大片先會拍到六個月
呢套呢個戲咧，即係拍完之後辛苦係好辛苦，大家都認為你拍呢個戲即係比以前嘅辛苦好多。因為特別係程小東佢係自己第一部做導演，佢自己嘅壓力相當之大，變咗拍完之後佢重睇重睇，或者又要求重拍嘅部分都好多。咁但係到我哋誒睇視片嘅時候，誒、呃、認為大家辛苦咗都值得，係即係包括而家隔咗咁長時間，我哋攞翻出嚟睇。都覺得個幾好幾好玩，即係都都唔錯，都唔錯嚇。或者即係而家就算拍都未必會拍得翻咁好嘅戲，只不過係個節奏可能或或者仲會快翻啲咁解。如果嘢要再拍嘅話，因為剪呢啲動作嘅片係佢自己剪嘅，佢唔會經過任何攝影，因為只有佢自己個腦先知道呢啲係乜嘢。咁變咗佢唔會經過人哋剪，但係佢佢要求你，譬如彈牀起跳斬咁一個咁嘅動作，佢會正面拍一次，側面拍一次。或者好 close up 咁，好好近咁，好大咁拍一次，或者好遠咁啊，亂咗一次，一個動作佢會可能會拍五次，但係佢剪出嚟會覺得好舒服。即係開頭我哋都唔係咁接受，但係咧佢剪出嚟佢嘅構思出嚟係絕對好嘅。誒、呃，日後亦都好多導演用咗佢呢一種方法，因為你一個動作係清清楚楚一下一下咧，就變咗已經係喺嗰個時候覺得係冇咁個畫面畫面感冇咁舒服，同埋好似～慢咗，同埋好似即係嗰陣時講叫做落後咗，所以佢呢一種叫做創新，直直至到用到今日都仲喺度用緊。一個鏡頭直落打十幾十幾招招式計下，十幾招式，我我記動作係比較快啲，即係比一般人記動作快，同埋好肯定唔會錯。所以我就從來都冇打傷過任何一個舞舞師嘅。咁但係、呃、我哋都每,每次都排練，由慢動,慢動作開始排排到，然後快快完之後正式拍。所以變咗一個時間，呢、這個戲都拍得相當耐。但係成個戲落嚟，我冇受過傷。呢、這個戲我冇受過傷，但係就好辛苦，因為特別係喺個 ending 嗰度，喺個嗰周。嗰度你哋睇出嚟好似好大，其實打嘅範圍好似呢間房咁多嘅啫。嗰啲石岩岩殘殘，咁我哋著嗰啲日本鞋，嗰啲好好麻煩，所以有時見唔到腳嘅時候，其實我哋著波鞋去去打，因為嗰啲石太太尖太細個地方，同埋嗰度跌落去係好高嘅。特別係後屘我掉出去嗰陣時，哇！嗰度如果跌咗落去都係咁先啦，冇得救噶啦。同埋嗰度冇樹。冇嘢俾你綁威亞嘅，咁、那個導演就要用八個舞師將個威亞全部綁曬喺每一個人嘅身上邊，即係如果要跌就一串，大家一齊一齊落曬去，咁變咗即係佢俾我嘅信心就係有八個人都圈住曬，放手就一齊，就即係如果燒手嘅話，個威亞燒手嘅話都一齊跌落去嘅，咁變咗佢全部圈住曬，冇嘢綁係最危險最即係有有協議嗰就係嗰個鏡頭。受傷又冇受傷，因為你如果第啲地方拍咧，只可以咁樣拍。如果你稍為平啲，你因為佢要導演要求成日掹翻個環境，見翻現場個個山景啊，或者佢有時喺後邊佢放煙啊，佢要佢要求嗰個成個山嘅嘅勢喺度，所以我哋喺嗰度當地已經好細，但係仲要喺嗰度跳彈牀。跳彈牀唔係跳一下，有時佢要求係跳彈牀起，自己仲喺嗰度踩劍，即係嗰啲動作係現場諗出嚟嘅係好難度嘅，所以變咗個體力方面都都都好辛苦嘅嗰、那個係好辛苦。喺<笑>戲入邊嘅關係咧，就大家都有睇到啦，就即係。互相尊重對方係一個劍客，但係私底下其實我哋成日都係一齊坐埋去研究個戲應該點樣去，或者去到 ending 嗰度應該點樣死定唔死，或者係應該點樣去。我哋成日都坐埋，每一次食飯都坐埋傾偈，好融洽嘅我哋
。但係誒、呃、拍呢個生死決嘅時候，我知道佢嘅係冇功功夫底，佢只不過佢嘅動作係完全有跳舞跳芭蕾，因為導演有同我講過。佢只係記動作，俾同佢對對對打嘅時候行，佢行熟咗佢嘅動作之後，就叫佢俾翻啲力落去打，但係佢出嚟嘅效果非非常之好，<笑>就等於誒、呃、楊紫瓊其實都係咁樣，<笑>都係跳舞底嚟。個人本身咧就係好內向、好靜、好斯文嘅一個人，即係同佢演嗰個咁攻心計啊，咁即係內涵係儲清楚任何嘢，係完全兩個人，係完全兩個人。高雄即係佢嘅演技同佢嘅人係完全兩回事嚟嘅，嚇佢嘅演技相當好嘅。如果做一個演員嚟講咧，梗係希望嘗試任何嘅戲路，啊咩戲路都。但係每一個導演打電話嚟，都係揾我拍動作片，我都唔知點解。可能係唔唔係我想唔想問題，又唔係冇得話唔中意嘅。咁我自己都好中意拍動作片嘅。咁啊，如果有機會嘗試拍其他嘅片咧，咁啊，當然係更加好啦。我亦都同好多導演曾經講過，我話喂，誒、呃、有冇路轉咧？有冇即係或者轉啲第二啲角色做下？但係佢哋嘅感覺就係、是、話，你一行出嚟就大合，你一行出嚟，如果話你唔識打，我如果擺一部戲喺你喺前邊係唔識打嘅，係冇人會相信嘅。如果要講拍片咧，就梗係拍時裝舒服啦，唔使黐住啲頭套，唔使著五六件衫。又揸刀揸劍又彈床又威也，時裝片最多咪碌兩個關鬥啊，三四樓跳下，掹槍打幾槍啊，拳腳啊咁好舒服嘅。誒、呃，時裝片舒服過古裝片好多嘅，因為一般到而家人已經習慣咗叫我大俠大俠大俠，因為拍古裝拍得多，成日揸住把劍喺佢哋心目中已經係一個大俠嚟嘅。咁但係好奇怪喎，時裝片咧就一定揾我做黑社會大哥嘅。你嗱，你翻查下就知啦。黑社會大哥時裝片咧就梗係梗係我做好少做好人嘅，但係古裝咧我就實係做大俠嘅劍劍俠啊，即係即係中意間都好啦，總之都係好威風嘅。咁呢個係唔知佢哋點睇法，但係喺對我自己嚟講咧，我都會分得好清楚嘅。即係誒，譬如就算古裝片演壞蛋，我都都會留意下點樣去演，去演到佢最好，即係觀眾會認為哇，真係黑人憎為止。我唔會話因為。演得太壞，如驚人哋會話我乜嘢啊？哇！呢、這個壞蛋嚟嘅咩咩？因為以前咧，好多人都會怕呢樣嘢，但係其實而家今日嘅觀眾嘅水平，佢哋嘅知識水平已經唔係喺呢一度嘅啦。你越壞，佢就越覺得嗯呢、這個演得好，<笑>所以我演好演壞，我自己都會搞得好清楚去去演繹出嚟。<笑>首先喺度多謝誒普樂場嘅 fans 啦，誒即係一路一直以嚟誒咁咁捧我場睇我嘅戲啦，咁所以喺呢度冇咩同大家講，只係祝大家身體健康，誒事事如意，開開心心。